Thank you, Chairperson, for kind words of introduction. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv Chawla and Dr. Shalini Jaggi for giving me an opportunity to talk on a topic which is time in range, which is very, very close to my heart, and established metrics in diabetes management. We know that the era of diabetes control before 1922, when insulin was not there, there was hardly any way of monitoring diabetes or controlling diabetes. Then we started with insulin therapy. From 1980 to 2016, it was modern insulin. It was many more oral anti-diabetic therapy have come. Most of the people started monitoring sugar also. That was very, very important. It's a self-monitoring of blood glucose. And then it was A1C, which gives you average glucose of last three months. And this was established almost from 1980 to 2015. Now, if you see from 2016 onward, what we are using advanced insulin. Now, we also use self-monitoring of blood glucose, but we started using continuous glucose monitoring. There is an advanced hardware of using continuous glucose monitoring along with algorithm assistance. HbA1c is still used for monitoring. But there is an emerging use of continuous glucose monitoring for our patients. And we now have a time in range, a concept have come for monitoring rather than only dependent on A1C. The future will be probably more advanced insulin will be there. We will be using more continuous glucose monitoring with refined hardware and software with more algorithm assistance. So person can, with a uh, time in range will be an established for monitoring and that's what the future which we are seeing. We know there are three pillars to manage the dysglycemia. Before UKPDS and DCCT trial, we understood that it is the hyperglycemia which is to be controlled and with this trial has shown us by better glycemic control, you are reducing A1C and decreasing the diabetes related complication. But the limiting factor was hypoglycemia. And because of hypoglycemia, we could not achieve a tight glycemic control for most of our diabetic patients. Then we understood it is not only the glucose control or less hypoglycemia, it is the glycemic variability. And to know the glycemic variability, we have to have a continuous glucose monitoring. And if we have a continuous glucose monitoring, you will be able to know the glycemic variability. And through that, we could know what is time in range that in 24 hours, how much time person is remaining in range, that is more important rather than just controlling the HbA1c, which is to be considered as one of the best way of monitoring diabetes. So what I'm going to talk, the era of A1c and its limitation, then I'll be talking the time in range in type 2 diabetes. We know that it is almost established for all type 1 diabetes patients, but I'll be talking more for type 2 diabetes also. We also would like to understand the, whether this new metrics time in range is directly related with complications or not, and then we will conclude. Almost 25 years before, DCCT established the importance of A1C. Higher the A1C, more the microvascular complication. And one should try to keep A1C as low as possible, but preferably less than 7, and you will find less and less diabetes complication in type 1 diabetic patients that what DCCT had established. But we wonder about doing a A1C every 3 months. What time of day are in range blood glucose level, which are high or low? We don't know anything if we just get the A1C report after every three months. How you are going to adjust the dose of a medication, the timing of the medication. Suppose you have a patient with a 8 A1C and you don't know whether I have to control it is post meal glucose level more or fasting more because you may have a person with a fasting established well control and post meal is high. You may have A1C of 8. Some other patients may have Fasting, which is slightly higher and post meal glucose is absolutely normal. You don't know. So when the medication is to be adjusted only on A1C, it's real difficult. What's going on with food, sleep, exercise, stress, decision, what is working, what is not working. Unless we do continuous glucose monitoring, we can't know about it. I just made a change. Today you have changed some medication, some therapy. 
But will it make a difference? You have to wait for another three months to see the A1C. And if it is not getting control, you don't know. If this three months is already been vested and the patient is still in hyperglycemia or in between patient developing hypoglycemia, you don't know. The quality of life, because if it, someone may have a good control of A1C, but the quality of life may not improve because there is multiple hypo and hyper could be there. And what experiment should I try going forward? We don't know whether if I change this or if I change my diet pattern or my exercise pattern, will it help to control my glucose or not? Only by getting quarterly A1C will not give any such answer. You may have, as I already told you, a three different type of patient with a well-controlled diabetes with A1C of 7. A one patient may have absolutely 100% of the time in range. If you just do the continuous glucose monitoring, the sugar remains normal. There could be other patient who is having only 70% of the time in range, 5% may be in hypoglycemia and 25% of the time the sugar may be high. But a other patient who may have still A1C of 7, but 20% of the time person might be in hypoglycemia. 40% of the time the sugar may be high. It is only 40% of the time the person is range and still you can have A1C of 7. So there could be many phase of a good control or many phase of a uncontrolled diabetes and different type of patients you may see. So the creditability of HbA1c is a target for type 2 diabetes. It's been established with UKPDS, Accord, Advanced, VADT. They demonstrated that intensive glycemic control does not reduce the incidence of macrovascular events. We don't know why it is there. It does not decrease the mortality in type 2 diabetes. Since majority of patients with type 2 diabetes with numbers snowballing quickly on a global scale, any new glycemic metric should be tested for its effectiveness to associate with type 2 diabetes complication to replace the long-standing A1C. We know that A1C was uh, the only way a tight glycemic control for Accord Advance and VADT, but majority of our diabetic patients, even after intensive glucose control, we could not decrease the macrovascular events or mortality also. So in novel metrics, that is time in range, a time in range refers to time spent in an individual target glucose level, that is between 70 to 180. And for a tighter glycemic control with a hyperglycemic pregnancy, it should be between 70 to 140. The percentage time spent below, that what we call time below range, or the percentage time above range, what we call is time above range. Time in range may be used an appropriate endpoint in clinical research as a measure of glycemic control in patients with diabetes. Emerging evidence suggests that time in range is inversely correlated to risk of developing microvascular and macrovascular complication in patients with diabetes. If I compare between HbA1c and time in range, A1c evaluates single value while it evaluates continuous glucose level. A1c compares every three months time in range compares any time periods. A1c does not capture any hypoglycemia and hyperglycemic level occurring on the same day, while time in range capture all glucose level for given time frame and identified time within a safe range. A1c immediately effect of therapy changes not recorded. Time in range immediately detects acute effect of therapy changes. HbA1c is a bad correlation with uh, uh, patient reported outcome while there is a good correlation with patient related outcome with time in range. Time in range has low susceptibility to interference while the HbA1c because of various laboratory or anemia or is there is a possibility of high susceptibility to interference. The only advantage is probably it has got a good correlation with clinical endpoints with many long-term study because A1c is established since last almost 35-40 years while time in range is a new metric and probably we will have many more study which will be we will see in coming future if i do a patient with a only self monitoring of blood glucose you may have a patient a typical type 1 diabetic patients doing four times in a day or five times in a day you will find out of five four reports are normal absolutely patient you can say that is out of five reports of self monitoring of blood glucose level except this post lunch sugar which is coming 200 all four reports are normal but if I do the same patient with a continuous glucose monitoring, you'll be surprised to know that patient actually getting pre-lunch hypoglycemia, post-lunch hyperglycemia and midnight 
hypoglycemia. So actually we are missing, if I do only self-monitoring of blood glucose, two major episodes of hypoglycemia in this patient also. Now the utility of doing a continuous glucose monitoring, again going back for DCCT trial, in 1983 when DCCT trial was done, to achieve a target A1C of 7, the mean A1C was 9 for all those patients who were the participant in this particular trial, the severe hypoglycemia rate was 62 per 100 patient a year. So hypoglycemia is a limiting factor, the mean A1C still they could achieve 7.2 which is very good in a type 1 diabetic patients by giving them a multiple uh, short acting insulin dose as well as a long acting like a NPH insulin twice daily but and monitoring the sugar between four to five times a day but still the risk of hypoglycemia was very very high and it was severe hypoglycemia 62 per 100 patient year. So in 2008 after 25 years if I put the same study almost similar study with a JDR of CGM these patients were on a continuous glucose monitoring. The mean A1C was not 9, it was 7.6. Already they were better control and they could achieve 7.1, which is further good control in these type 1 patients. But the only advantage they were having now continuous glucose monitoring. Yes, definitely newer insulin were also used for this. In a pivotal trial in 2016, after 8 years, it was an integrated CGM where pump along with continuous glucose monitoring was used. They could achieve from mean A1C of 7.7 .7 to 6.9 with a 0% hypoglycemia. <clears throat> so you can understand the importance of continuous glucose monitoring in type 1. But I will be talking for type 2 also. On this, there was an international consensus on use of continuous glucose monitoring in 2017. I was luckily part of this consensus and we had come that for all type 1 diabetic patients, if possible, they should be using continuous glucose monitoring. Then the consensus was also for the person with hyperglycemia pregnancy in elderly for type 2 diabetic who are on insulin, who are at the risk of developing hypoglycemia, those who have established cardiovascular disease where hypoglycemia could be more uh, risk as well as the persons with hypoglycemia and awareness, they should be using continuous glucose monitoring. Then after two years, uh, with the CGM data, if somebody is using CGM, what should be the time in range? What should be the glucose control? Or glucose in range? So in a regular type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients, more than 70% of the time, the person should remain between 70 to 180. But it is not allowed to have hypoglycemia more than 5% of the time. Sugar going below 72. But not even more than 1% of the time, if sugar goes below 54, we have to change the therapy. That's very, very important. So for type 1 and type 2 diabetes, 70 to 180 uh, class uh, 1 hyperglycemia is still okay for less than 25% and less than 5% of the time, even it is okay if they go more than 250. But if they are more than that, then we have to change the therapy. Again, I was the part of this time in range concept and this consensus. In 2019, it was published and then it is accepted by all over the world, including all major organizations like American Diabetic Association and European Association of Study of Diabetes. If somebody is elderly, high risk, risk of hypoglycemia are more, is still more than 50% of the time, they should be between 70 to 180. And it is not allowed to go even 1% of the time going below 70. That's very, very important. In pregnancy, this becomes slightly more tighter. Instead of 70 to 180, 63 to 140. And that's very important for pregnancy, particularly in type 1 diabetes. Pregnancy, hyperglycemia and pregnancy, GDM or pregestational diabetes, the target range is 63 to 140. But then we want at least 90% of the time they should be in this range. 5% it is acceptable if they go more than 140 and 5% it is acceptable if their sugar goes below 63 also. So this is an international consensus for CGM data interpretation. The standardization of CGM metrics, then we should try to increase the time in range and decrease the time below range and decrease the time above range. Then how frequently? For type 2 diabetic patient as international consensus was talking about type 1 diabetes, they should be on continuous. For type 2 also, they talked about there should be continuous glucose monitoring for some type of patients. But what about the routine type 2 diabetic patients? And this is recently 
myself along with Dr. Jyoti Dev and Anup Mishra, that what should be the frequency of continuous glucose monitoring, which is recommendation from South Asia, where we had also included Pratik Chaudhary, Dr. Akhtar Hussain, who is IDF President-elect, Dr. Shashank Joshi, and our President, Dr. Uh, Arvind, uh, and many more, Siddharth one from Indonesia, and Shashank from IDF Southeast Asia, that what should be the frequency of continuous glucose monitoring. If somebody is keeping because we are using a professional one and maybe every three months or every two months. So those who are uncontrolled and we want to achieve a good control, even it can be done for every month or the risk of hypo is more. If they are well controlled, even it is once in three months, if risk of hypoglycemia is more for them. Otherwise, if they are well controlled, even once in six months is also fine. So that's what frequency of doing continuous glucose monitoring to know about the time in range in type 2 diabetic patients, we had put a, a frequency of doing this continuous glucose monitoring, which is professional one, which we are using. The future recommendation for these is once in six months, once in three months, and once in two months, as dependent on how much time in day a person is keeping. Accordingly, they can do their continuous glucose monitoring more and more. Time in range should be considered in a target for even type 2 diabetes also. I had written a paper for this that time in range should be considered a target not for type 1 only it should be also for type 2 diabetes and we have written in this particular paper that is using a continuous glucose monitoring and then asking the patient to keep their glucose in range and time in range it itself is an educational and motivational tool for them now, in the scientific meeting, we wanted to know that whether this new matrix time in range is correlated with complications or not, because we have a lot of study with A1C, but do we have the data with time in range? There is a validation of time in range is an outcome measure for diabetes clinical trial. This is a paper which is written by in Diabetes Care in 2019, immediately after then time in range as a metric, <coughs> as a consensus which was published in Diabetes Care. There is a strong association of time in range with the risk of microvascular complication. When a person's time in range is better, there is a less complication, less microvascular complication. Similarly, the persons who have uh, lesser the time in range, they have more chances of risk of retinopathy and microalbuminuria. There is also a data of glycemic variability with cardiovascular clinical outcome. A person with a uh, lesser glycemic, uh, more glycemic variability and less in time in range found to have a worse cardiovascular outcome too. The similar data is also found with diabetes and kidney disease with the persons with less in time in range and more with glycemic variability found to have more with diabetes, kidney disease. And this data was there not only for type 1 diabetes, but it was also for type 2 diabetes too. The blood glucose variability leads to rapid progression of coronary artery disease. Even a type 2 diabetic patient with a lot of glucose variability with a coronary artery disease, otherwise also very high risk for a type 2 diabetic patient, but they get rapidly progress for coronary artery disease too. Glycemic variability predicts the development of end stressional disease in type 2 diabetic patients too. There is a association of time in range with the continuous glucose monitoring, the prevalence of diabetes retinopathy in type 2 diabetic patient. This is one of the paper again in 2018 from Korea. It was published. There is a paper for type 2 diabetic patient with a time in range with carotid intima media thickness. The persons with less in time in range, there is a more uh, macrovascular complication and more carotid intima media thickness was found in compared to the persons who have better time in range. Even from India also, Sanjay Kalra have published one paper that outcome of time in range, the lesser by 10%, there is an increase in risk of retinopathy risk. There is a less time in range by 10%, the increase in nephropathy risk increased by 40% and time in range less by 10%, there is a neuropathy risk which increased by 25%. So this is the initial evidence also show increase in surrogate markers of macrovascular complication like abnormal carotid intima media thickness also. So this paper from India had also established the time in range uh, is directly proportional with the complications too. So the approach to further use of time in range across three stages of maturity establish importance of time in range for blood glucose management across the key stakeholder. First and foremost thing what we are doing is across the key stakeholder they should use or understand the importance of time in range. The advance is advanced importance of time in range and promote ease of use of technology to enable use of time in range. Unless 
uh, our patient understand increasing the awareness about it importance first the doctor healthcare professional has to understand and then we have to use promote the use of technology which is continuous glucose monitoring the perpetuate the use of time in range to sustain blood glucose management across all persons with diabetic population so the person who are using continuous glucose monitoring first the, we have to increase the awareness and then using this technology and then we have to understand then those who are using we have to find they are better getting time in range in their day-to-day uh, -day instead of going for a1c to conclude my talk training programs have an integral role in implementing time in range as a useful clinical measure that complement a1c currently because we are using so i can't say that a1c you remove and do only time in range but at present it complement a1c in daily treatment decision making studies have substantially demonstrated potential use of time in range as a patient-centric metric for glycemic control in type 2 diabetes despite its proven value the clinical utilization of time in range for type 2 diabetes management has remained and suboptimal and i think these meetings and the conferences and talking more about time in range uh, we are going to increase the awareness about the time in range and continuous glucose monitoring first with healthcare professional and then with the patient time in range has a robust association with micro and macrovascular complication and should be positioned as an end point and valued metric for type 2 diabetes management a1c we know that it's a gold standard but glycemic variability is associated with increased risk of hypoglycemia hyperglycemia and reducing diabetic quality of life with increasing diabetes complication time in range provides a closer view of person's glycemic status it adds in better glycemic control increasing time in range has been shown to have association with reducing microvascular macrovascular complication in people with diabetes there are international guidelines have now been updated to include consensus on cgm data interpretation and a need exist to move beyond a1c alone and also consider ccm data for optimal diabetes management with this i thank once again thank you dr rajiv chawla and dr shalini for giving me this opportunity